Good evening and welcome to the Marin Interfaith Council's Getting to Know Your Neighbor's Faith, Ask Me Anything. And this is our fourth time meeting um, and our second time with Sherna. Sherna was our first guest and um, unfortunately we had horrible sound issues. So anyone who was online couldn't hear a thing. I was one of those people um, struggling to hear. So we invited her back to share her Baha'i faith. And so um, we are very grateful for her to, for coming a second time and grateful for all of you online and um, those here present. Um, next month, this is a month, monthly uh, engagement uh, event. So next month, our speaker will be Imam Fasi from the Muslim faith. So it will be on, um, I think it's the 15th of, of um, February. So please join us then six o'clock in person here or on Zoom. And I'm sure we will learn a lot like we have so far every night. I've learned a ton and been and very thrilled with learning about all these different faiths. So um, if you are joining us for the first time, welcome. If you're joining us for the fourth time, welcome also. But we all, um, if you would like to make a donation, we, uh, Scott can type it into the chat, but you can find a button to do so on our website or Scott will type the inner the uh, website no name into the chat box and we will I will first um, introduce Sherna and give a little read her a uh, little about a little bit about her and then um, we'll have an opening prayer from Pat Clark, who is a member of the Baha'i faith. And then Sherna will talk to us about her faith and then we'll have time for questions, lots of time for questions, because that's really the intention of the evening is to, for us to ask questions. So let me tell you about Sherna. Sherna became a member of the Baha'i faith in Los Angeles in 1978 while she was working for Jacques Cousteau, host of the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau television series as a writer, lecturer and public relations officer. In 1983, she was invited to serve at the Baha'i World Center in Haifa, Israel, and there worked with governmental officials and media representatives at the local and national levels. At the Baha'i World Center, she also served as the head of the Department of Publishing and as director of the public tours operation, managing a staff of Christians, Jews, Muslims, and Druze. Sherna and her husband, Bryn, moved to San Rafael in 2002 and for 12 years, she worked for the Superior Court of California as administrator of the Virtual Self Help Law Center. She retired in 2014 and now serves as faculty of the Wilmette Institute, a Baha'i online learning center. She and her husband love to travel and have been around the world a number of times, including visits to over 70 countries on every continent except Antarctica. <laughs> Also, she is the Interfaith Council appointee to the Buck Family Fund Board of Trustees. So that's the introduction. Now I will invite Pat to come up and say our opening prayer. We can pray now. Blessed is the spot and the house and the place and the city and the heart and the mountain and the refuge and the cave and the valley and the land and the sea and the island and the meadow where mention of God hath been made and his praise glorified. Many years ago, someone asked the head of the Baha'i faith at that time, what is a Baha'i? And he is reported to have replied, to be a Baha'i simply means to love the world of all of humanity and try to serve it. I'll say that again, to be a Baha'i simply means to love all the world, to love humanity and try to serve it. So that's kind of it. 
Um, so that, that's really the essence of our faith in more pragmatic terms. The Baha'i faith is a relatively new religion, having been established by Baha'u'llah in the 19th century. It initially uh, developed in Persia and parts of the Middle East, but it is now found all over the world. There are three principles that are central to the teachings of Baha'u'llah. The unity of God, the unity of religion, and the unity of humanity. Baha'is believe that periodically, God reveals his will through divine messengers, whose purpose is to transform the character of humankind and to develop within those who respond, moral and spiritual qualities. Religion is thus seen by Baha'is as orderly, unified, and progressive. There are about 8 million Baha'is in the world with followers in virtually every tribe, race, and nationality on the planet. According to Wikipedia, during the past 100 years, the Baha'i faith was the fastest growing religion in the world, growing at least twice as fast as the population in virtually every United Nations region. There are not yet any countries where the Baha'i faith is the largest religion in the country, but there are a number of countries where the Baha'i faith is the second largest religion in Iran, in the Middle East, in Zambia, Africa, in Bolivia, South America, Cambodia, Southeast Asia, in Papua New Guinea, in Oceania, and more countries. So it's a real thing. Uh, and there are millions of people all over the world who are followers of Baha'u'llah. So the question is, who is Baha'u'llah? To understand Baha'u'llah and his teachings, it would help first to understand the Baha'i belief that humanity as a species is evolving in a way similar to the way we evolve as individuals. That is, there are periods and stages in the collective life of humanity. At one time, we as a species we're passing through our stage of infancy, then childhood. We are now in our period of turbulent adolescence, but we are moving into the long promised phase of maturity. It is our understanding that as we have evolved and matured, God has sent great teachers at every step of the way we believe that there have been a multitude of great teachers whose history has been lost in the midst of time. We know something about Buddha and the line of prophets descended from Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad. One thing that's interesting about Baha'u'llah is that he's also a descendant of Abraham through Abraham's wife, Sarah, on his mother's side and Abraham's wife, Keturah, on his father's side. We know this because Baha'u'llah was born into a noble family in Persia. And noble families keep genealogies, like the begats in the Bible. His father held a high ranking position in the court of the Persian king. And they had enormous wealth, similar to Siddhartha who became the Buddha. From an early age, Baha'u'llah showed signs of greatness and displayed extraordinary knowledge and wisdom. He did not attend regular school, but did receive some instruction from tutors. He did learn to read and write, for example, and was well-versed in the works of the great Persian poets in the art of calligraphy, in the skill of horsemanship, gentlemanly 
pursuit. When he was 18 years old, his family arranged for his marriage to a woman from another, another great family. And it is said that it took 40 camels to carry her dowry from her home to his ancestral home. When his father passed away, Baha'u'llah was asked to follow in his footsteps and assume the decision in the court of the king, but he refused. He was not interested in the titles and honors of this world. Uh, his interest lie in defending the poor and protecting the needy. His home became a shelter for all. No one went away. No one was just denied hospitality. When Baha'u'llah was 27 years old, he learned about the teachings of the Bab, a Persian youth who was calling for religious renewal in Iran. This was 1844. And if you know religious history, the 1800s represented a time of great expectation around the world. For Christians, for example, prophecies from the Old Testament, such as Isaiah and Daniel, aligned with prophecies from the Gospel and Revelation, led some scholars to predict the return of Christ around the year 1843, 1844. Meanwhile, Muslims experienced similar excitement around the same time. Prophecies from Sunni and Shia tradition also foretold the appearance of a promised one in the year 1844. So the Bab, spelled E-A-B, by the way, it means the gate in Arabic, told the people to prepare themselves for him whom God shall make manifest. The Bab himself brought a whole new set of teachings to Persia. He brought a new calendar, for example, changed the direction to which his followers should pray, and called for the elimination of clergy. Again, if you know religious history, you'll not be surprised that his teachings were not well received by the religious leaders at that time. And the Bab was executed in 1850. During the 1850s, some 20,000 of the Bab's followers were killed in the most barbaric ways. Some were shot out of cannons. For example, others were drawn and quartered. As one of the Bab's followers, Baha'u'llah was also beaten in a prison. But he was not executed, possibly because of his royal lineage. Rather, he was exiled from Persia sent from place to place, until finally he was sent to the city of Akka in the Holy Land, now called Israel. It was in the Holy Land that a European scholar met Baha'u'llah. His name was Edward Granville Brown, a Cambridge Orientalist, and he recorded the words of Baha'u'llah, including these. Baha'u'llah said, has come to see a prisoner and an exile. We desire but the good of this world and the happiness of the nations, yet they deem us a stir up of strife and sedition worthy of bondage and banishment. That all nations should become one in faith and all men as brothers, that the bonds of affection and unity between the sons of men should be strengthened, that the differences of races be annulled. What harm is there in this? Yet so it shall be. These fruitless strifes, these ruinous wars shall pass away, and the most great peace shall come. Do not you in Europe need this also? Is not this what Christ 
we're told. Now I've condensed years of history and volumes of teachings into a few short paragraphs. But here is the most important thing to know about Baha'u'llah. Baha'is believe that he is the prophet of God for this day. And we offer three proofs of a prophet for your consideration. First, consider his life. He was born a wealthy nobleman and willingly gave up all his wealth and political advantage to be able to bring the teachings of peace and justice to the world. He died as a prisoner and then exile. Second, consider his writings. Baha'u'llah began writing letters, epistles, and entire books in the 1850s. And he continued writing until he died in 1892. Over the years, he discussed scientific matters, including astronomy, biology, medical sciences, etc. And he gave expositions on the meanings of the gospel and other holy books. He wrote lengthy tablets on sociology and government and so much more, including many mystical writings. In the breadth and depth of Baha'u'llah's writings, we find the teaching humanity needs now to address contemporary problems and the way forward to build a new peaceful global civilization. Third, consider the effects of Baha'u'llah on the peoples of the world. Baha'u'llah taught that the refinement of one's inner character and service to humanity are inseparable facts, facets of life. Every man, woman, and child has this twofold moral purpose to attend to his or her own spiritual and intellectual growth and to contribute to the transformation of society. Teaching children that they, teaching children that they are noble beings, each with a special gift to offer to humankind, is a powerful way to start to, to develop the understanding of this two, twofold purpose. When children reach the age of 11 or 12, the concepts of his or her responsibility to the wider, wider community are more openly discussed. And by the time a young person has reached the age of 15, he or she is considered an adult with full responsibility for his or her own spiritual development. The Baha'i teaching of equality of men and women have a very profound effect on some communities. And the tool of using Baha'i consultation for collective decision making has transformed populations. And groups of people all over the world are applying to uh, working to apply Baha'u'llah's teachings to their personal and collective lives. It is profoundly moving to witness. So the, um, what is the same about the Baha'i faith uh, and what is different? It's very, very common for people to say, oh, uh, the Baha'i faith is like the religion in which I was born. And that's true. So to, um, to explore this, <clears throat> we need to explore the definition of the word religion. According to Baha'i teachings, the core of religious faith is that mystic feeling which unites man with God. I will say that again, the core of religious faith is that mystic feeling that unites man with God. So to even begin to talk about that definition of faith, we need to talk about the word God. I know that in some religious traditions, they are not even supposed to say the word G hyphen D. And some religious traditions, the word God is not used at all. 
and that's fine. It's all good because as Baha'is, what we call God is actually an unknowable essence. For Baha'is, God is not a Caucasian man with a long beard, for example. We know God's not that. On the other hand, there's definitely something bigger than we are. We cannot go out into the desert at night and look up at all those stars and think we are the beginning and the end of all creation. Something has created us, however you define that something. English-speaking Baha'is use the word God as a shorthand for that huge theological discussion. And we simply say that God created us and the created cannot understand the creator. A painting cannot understand the painter. The painter's very existence is incomprehensible to the painting on the wall. So we use the word God as a convenience for referring to that great creative force. And in our world, on this planet, God made the heavens and the earth and all that dwell therein, as they say, the mountains, the valleys, the meadows, the deserts, the seas, and the forest. God created the animals and God created us, human beings. And the reason for our creation, we are told by Baha'u'llah, is love. Baha'u'llah wrote, O oh, son of man, I love thy creation, hence I created thee. Wherefore do thou love me that I may name thy name and fill thy soul with the spirit of life. So God's existence is beyond our understanding. Uh, his love touches our lives and our beings ceaselessly. And one of the things that religions do is to help open our minds and our hearts to receive God's love. It is in this way that the Baha'i faith is like other religions. Baha'is are enjoined to pray and to meditate we have a period of fasting, very similar to the, uh, the Muslim fast. We have holy days and other ways to connect to that mystic feeling, which we unites us with God. As I said, it's very common for people around the world to encounter the Baha'i faith and say, oh, it's just like the religion I grew up with, whatever religion they grew up with prayer, meditation, the celebration of Holy Days, so similar in effect, if not in specifics. So then what's different about the Baha'i faith? What is different is our understanding of the purpose of religion. We've talked a little bit about what religion is, but now we ask, why do we need it? What the Baha'i teachings say is that, quote, to help populations take charge of their own spiritual, social, and economic development, and through all such efforts to bring about the betterment of the world, express the very purpose of religion itself. I'll read that again, because it's quite different from my understanding of the purpose of religion when I was growing up to help populations take charge of their own spiritual, social, and economic development, and through all such efforts to bring about the betterment of the world, express the very purpose of religion itself. The scriptures of many of the great faiths offer us prophecies of a better world to come, a promised golden age of human civilization. The teachings of Baha'u'llah give us a roadmap on how to get from here to there. 
all this teaching us about our spiritual lives are the same as the founders of all the world's great religions. Eternal in the past, eternal in the future. His teachings about how we organize our social lives are quite different. Their goal is to move humanity into the age of maturity. Among the fundamental principles of the Baha'i faith of the need for the independent investigation of truth. Each person is responsible for his or her own exploration of reality. To do this, Baha'u'llah calls for universal education of all children. This calls for the elimination of prejudices. That is the strong emotional attachment to an idea regardless of whether that idea is reasonable or not. Science and religion should agree, Baha'u'llah taught. Science is the way we describe the world and religion is the way we should live in it. They're just two systems of knowledge, not contradictory. Women and men are equal, Baha'u'llah said. They are like two wings of a bird. Not the same, but if one wing is not allowed to fully develop, the bird cannot fly. And there's lots of uh, high writings about economics, for example. Baha'u'llah calling for the elimination of the extremes of wealth and poverty. And there's so much more. There's lots more. I think I'll stop and leave time for questions. Well, thank you, Sharna, for um, kind of the outline of your faith. Um, so now, if you have any questions in on the, um, those of you online, I think, or even here, um, please feel free to enter them. Um, I have a question, of course, but um, it's, you know, in the, in the Christian faith of which I'm a part, Baha'u'llah Baha Baha seemed to come into it a little more aware of equality and, you know, just in, in terms of everyone the same. But like in the Christian tradition, our faith, our Bibles, we've, we've done different translations of everything. And I know you have prayers. Do they get changed at the same or do they, I mean, so he wrote many of his sayings. Are any of those changed? Like we have the King James version of the Bible. We have the new, you know, do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, okay, so Baha'u'llah uh, lived 100 and, he died in 1892, um, and he wrote uh, basically in Persian and in Arabic, and um, his grandson, who, uh, who was called Shoghi Effendi, the, 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 the seeker, um, and he, Shoghi Effendi was sent to school First, he went to grammar school in a French uh, school. He lived in Haifa at the time that it was a Turkish mandate and then British. So Turkish and, British and English were around them. And then he lived in a Persian home. Um, and then he was sent to school, to elementary school to learn French. And then he was sent to high school to learn English uh, with the intention of being a translator. I mean, so, the, so, so he was trained from very early age to be translated. And then he went to Oxford University and studied uh, uh, English at Oxford University in England. Um, so he, so, uh, he, did, he was born three years after Baha'u'llah died, uh, but his grandfather, uh, Baha'u'llah's oldest son, was alive. And so at a very early age, Shoghi Feni started translating the writings of Baha'u'llah into primarily into English. And his translations are the foundation that Baha'is today use for trans continuing to tra translate the uh, writings of Baha'u'llah. There are uh, thousands of letters and, and so forth of Baha'u'llah, and we can see them. 
the, uh, man, many of them exist in the archives in uh, Israel, and you can go in and see them. Uh, Shoghi Effendi was the one who did the initial translation, and they continue translating more and more into English for us, but based on the writings of uh, the, the translation, the concept of Shoghi Effendi. So, um, and then from, from English, uh, because it was the, 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 the Holy Family who trans did the initial translations, all the other languages of the world, but high materials in over 800 languages of the world, but they translate from the English. Uh, so in Papua New Guinea and uh, so for instance, Somalia and whatever, they, uh, they translate the writings from English into their native language. Does that answer the question? Is that right? yeah. 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 So you had to ask uh, last time if, if there is a holy book, um, and there is a, a holy book, um, the Book of Laws. And um, one of the things I said is that there, in the writings of Hola, there's maybe 5% exhortations of things you should do. To be kind to yourself, be kind to other people, honor your parents, nurture the children, take care of the needy. <laughs> um, pretty much what you expect a religious leader to say. So there's 5% exhortation and then 95% encouragement. Allah said, you're a child of God, you, you're created to be noble and you have the capacity of tremendous love and charity and so forth and so forth. So his uh, writings are full of encouragement uh, and be of service. The primary way we are asked to serve God is to serve our fellow humans. So, it's more than you ask. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> are there any questions online? Oh, yes. Put your questions into chat. That's how we know if you have questions. Um, I did have another one. You know, um, how do, do you have a specific day of the week that you gather together to worship or to pray? You know, the Christians have sun, you know, generally choose Sunday and, and do Saturday. So, yeah. so, um, so in the Baha'i, there is a Baha'i calendar of 19 months of 19 days. Um, we do not have a holy day. Uh, in the future when they're Baha'i uh, civilizations, um, there will be days of rest, which is not exactly the same as a holy day. Um, what, so we, don't, we do not have clergy, um, first thing. So uh, we're organized uh, geographically uh, by the, the country in which we live. So in Marin County, for example, there's Baha'is of Santa Fe, there's Baha'is of Fairfax, there's Baha'is of Novato. <clears throat> and once a Baha'i month, which is once every 19 days, the Baha'is in that community will get together for a community gathering, um, which has three parts. Um, first, we will say uh, prayers, people will read prayers. The second part is administrative. That's when, um, so, so we elect councils to guide the community during the year. So, the, so it's when the council will make a, a report about what is done for the last month and the people in the community can say to the council what they want it to do for the next month. And there's letters from the National Assembly it goes up and down and uh, a lot of communication for a period of, for that part of the feast. And then the last part is social. And it's very interesting that Baha'u'llah said that the social part is as important as prayers, for example, um, because getting to know each other and uh, being friends is, is to build a world based on peace and justice, uh, you need to be able to have, build friendships. So every 19 days we get together. Uh, in Marin County, we do not have a Baha'i center. Uh, there's Baha'i centers in San Francisco and Oakland, Berkeley and San Jose. And, uh, we do not have one here. Uh, so we meet in people's homes normally, but 
we could be we could meet in a park or we could meet in the seashore it doesn't really matter um, because the prayer that pat read in the beginning is any place where the mention of god is made it becomes a holy place it's a holy place by then. can i say a little bit about prayer a high prayer sure okay so um so baha'u'llah wrote a lot of prayers wrote a lot of prayers um there's a book of prayers and meditation but there's there's prayers for children there's prayers for expectant mothers there's prayers for passing and uh, all kinds so many prayers which are written and are the prayers of uh, baha'u'llah or his, his oldest son Abdul Baha. And, and so we have prayer books and, and a lot of when we uh, say prayers, uh, like in the morning, we'll read prayers from the prayer book. So that's uh, pro probably mostly what we do is read the prayers of Baha'u'llah or Abdul Baha. Also, uh, once a what day we're asked to say an obligatory prayer. Uh, and we have a choice of which obligatory prayer we want to say. <laughs> so we, there's a long one, which Saint Bryn, my, <laughs> my husband says a long obligatory prayer every morning. It's about eight minutes or something like that. And then there's a short middle one, and then there's the American one. <laughs> it's just <laughs> one I say. <laughs> uh, but anyway, you have a choice. But you're asked to say one of three prayers every day. Is, and then there's. Is that at any time during the day, or you, is it a set time? The long obligatory prayer is any time. The middle one, you say three times a day, and the uh, short one is around noon. So, so anyway, you, you pick uh, what you want to do. And then uh, there's just sitting and having a chat with your Lord. And just uh, usually, well, you just pull your heart out to the Lord, right? And um, it, it, it can be a meditation on the prayers you read. It can be a meditation on something that's going on in your life or, uh, but anyways, it's a different quality as you can imagine. It's just, it's very personal and, and you just sit and chat with your Lord. So that's the third kind of uh, prayer we have. Somebody asked me a while ago, if we ever cry when we pray? And the answer is, of course, of course. Um, depending on the circumstances of your life and, and you're turning to the, <laughs> your, your father, your, uh, and of course, there are times in which you pray and there are times in which you rejoice and uh, praise and thanksgiving of, uh, to the Lord. Anyway, so. Well, the, any questions in the chat? There is one. All right. Uh, here's a question from Chet. Uh, Sherna, if Baha'is believe in the unity of all religions, why do Baha'is believe that there's a need for a separate Baha'i community rather than become part of Christian, Jewish, Muslim communities and share Baha'i teachings within those religious communities and within all religious communities? Well, Baha'is <clears throat> Baha are certainly encouraged to participate with all kinds of communities that we're not, um, we would not, not participate. What is the reason that, I mean, there's a new religion and new social laws and new, new like consultation, new, new skills. And um, so, so although we don't have clergy, we do have a framework for organization locally nationally internationally um and so we we work together as baha'is and consult together and make decisions about a reality and what how many of us are there and what can we really do to be of service but we would absolutely work with other groups and and, and christians and, and and do um absolutely do so um so the bigger question is why a new religion, maybe, but having said that, we, that it is a new religion, that we work with everybody. Uh, anyway, so does that answer the question? I think so. Yeah. 
think so. Oh, you think <laughs> okay. I have a question. Yes. Uh, what are Baha'i, what's the Baha'i belief or perspective on what happens after someone dies? Well, the truth is we don't know. Um, so the, I guess everybody could hear that. The question is uh, what happens, uh, what is life after death? We believe there is life after death. Um, and the, the, in, for the individual soul, um, we believe that the soul, the, in, the individual soul is taking a drop from the sea of consciousness. This gets very mystical. A drop from the sea of consciousness is taken at the moment of conception and becomes the soul of the individual. So we come from a sea of consciousness, we become an individual, so soul which stays with us and is not in us, or the whole question of what is a soul. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so during this life, we, uh, we uh, develop our capacities to be kind, to be just, to be uh, trustworthy and so forth. And at the moment of death, our physical body uh, ends and our soul goes on towards God. But we don't have, we don't know a lot about what that means. Uh, what Paula said is only the good goes on. So uh, if, if uh, anything we've done good, we take with us. Anything we've, that's not so good <laughs> um, stays here. Uh, which makes the next world really sort of wonderful because it's only good. We don't believe in a physical heaven and hell. In fact, Baha'u'llah said uh, the next world is closer than your life thing. It's, it's here and there. And the, the only other thing he said is if we knew how wonderful the next world was, we would all go out and commit suicide to get there now. But it, part, but we are in this world, we're, we're spiritual beings in a physical path. And we are in this world to learn attributes like kindness and justice and patience and so forth. And then we take those and we have work to do in the next world. But it, it's, a, it's a spiritual world, it's not a physical world. We will know each other in the next world uh, and we will have work to do. But I don't, we don't, I don't know any more than that. Do you guys know any more than that? <laughs> so, so, I mean, basically, we don't know. But we'll find out. <laughs> um, I, I first met people from the Baha'i faith um, when I was in my 20s in Costa Rica, funny mm -hmm. thing. But um, they didn't drink. Is that a part of the faith? Yeah. Uh -huh. Can yeah. You so uh, there are very few things that we are asked not to do, but one is to, uh, Paula said that we are created to be noble beings and we are asked not to do anything that encourages us to be in, in, ignoble. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so Baha'is do not drink alcohol uh, and we do not take recreational drugs, but you can take drugs and doctor's prescriptions and so forth, of course, but um, so yeah, it's, we don't drink alcohol. But things like Coca-Cola, you can have and it's just, it's but pretty much always it's moderation is the key, but there are a few things uh, that we don't do. Smoking is not prohibited. Smoking tobacco, well, smoking right, is not prohibited, but it's abhorrent of God. So oh, there you go, <laughs> but, but it's not prohibited, for example. Yeah. My daughter would agree with that assessment. <laughs> uh, are there any more in the chat? Okay. Um, the Baha'is believe that Bahala is the last divine messenger or anticipate another prophet to appear uh, for the times other than appointed successors. Uh, so, the end, so the question is, do we believe there'll be more prophets in the future? And the answer is yes, absolutely. That as humanity goes and develops and matures, times change. In the time of Jesus, 
the fastest thing in the world was a horse. And now we live in the, <laughs> we're going to this, this space and the moon and so, so, so the, the fundamental things would be kind and be just and be trustworthy or don't change. That's who we are as creators. But the social conditions in which we live and, and work and organize ourselves change. So yes, of course, there will be a, a prophets in the future. And how I said every 500 or 1,000 years, uh, we don't know. One thing I, I guess about um, prophecies and, and prophets is that um, we believe that the, for the, well, we only know about the prophets uh, that have existed since the last ice age, pretty much. Uh, we don't, the, the, what, the civilizations before 10,000 years ago, we have bits and pieces of clay for, I don't know, whatever, pottery, but we really don't know a lot about it. Uh, so we, So for the last, 10,000 years more or less, people have been uh, prophesizing a time of the kingdom of God on earth, so a time of uh, maturity. And we believe that Baha'u'llah is, that the Bab was the, the point at which the age of prophecy ended and the age of fulfillment started. So we believe we are the beginning of a 500,000 year cycle of ever increasing maturity and peace and justice. So, so we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> but um, anyway, so yes, so there'll be every 500,000 years as humanity needs new teachings, God will send a great teacher. And once we know about uh, this is getting a little tricky history because of uh, you talked about things changing and stuff. The, the prophets who we just know about uh, have been men, physical, physically men. Uh, a lot of women scholars would say, well, they just don't write about the women. And anyway, but certainly in the future, right? soon, there'll be wonderful women prophets. But anyway, we don't know. <laughs> Are there any other questions in the chat now? Oh, yes. Oh. Um, is God separate from humanity? Um, yes and no. <laughs> so, um, so God is unknowable, right? God is something else. And Baha'u'llah said, to find God, turn unto thyself and stand me, see me standing. Do, do you remember the exact quote? I'm so bad, exact quote. Anyway, so, so we believe in the concept of oneness. So we are part of creation and God is part of creation and that creative force is so much bigger than we are. But so, so God's not a, a physical being, as we said, but we are part of his or her creation. Um, so, so God is bigger than humanity, but each of us individually has part of God in us. Does that make sense? Um, any questions from, I know we have many Baha'i sitting here. Are there any questions um, from any of you? <laughs> All the questions have been online or me or Scott. <laughs> so um, last time we talked about ritual a little bit, particularly the ritual of uh, uh, when a person dies. So it's, uh, an interesting subject in the Baha'i faith because we are told not to have rituals. And that said, we have a framework of the way we live our life. So, um, so the reason, my understanding, the reason to not have rituals 
is because they can be divisive. Um, Bryn and I lived in Israel for 19 years and families would have these huge fights about what was really a Jewish rit ritual. And, or you, you know, you go to this church and, and they do this and this and this, and you go to another church and they do it differently. And you say, oh, I'm doing it wrong. They're doing it wrong. So in the Baha'i faith, none of that. Um, we, we're not allowed to have rituals. That said, as individuals, ritual is, seems to be part of our human makeup. And you can have personal rituals, any kind of you want. We have a friend in um, Fort Bragg who has a prayer room. And she has a prayer rug and prayer beads. And, and that's wonderful. You can create any, Bryn and I have some rituals uh, that we do as a couple and uh, ones I do as myself. So you can, so there's something wonderful about rituals. What we cannot do is say, this works for me, so you have to do it. it it's, um, it's, but we do have a framework, like to say prayers every morning and evening and the calendar and the holy days and the feast and the, uh, so we do have a framework for our day and for our month and for the year. Uh, but Baha'is around the world celebrate it very differently. And that's fun. Uh, Baha'is all over the world will have a 19 day feast, this, this 19 day gathering. Uh, but if you're in Bolivia, they're gonna do it in Spanish and do wonderful dances, whatever. And if you're in Papua New Guinea, anyway. so, um, so everybody will do the same, follow the same outline, the same framework for action, but the, but the actual saying that this is what, this is how, how you're supposed to do it, how you're supposed to feel, how we're, uh, we're not allowed to do because it's inclusive, we're trying to include everybody. And I will tell you, when you go to a Baha'i Holy Day, you never know what's gonna happen. <laughs> Depends on who volunteers to organize. <laughs> Anyway, so it's an interesting subject. The difference between a framework and a, a ritual. So then like, you know, the, the, the Christian tradition has, it loves rituals. Yeah. Um, and we have marriages and, and funerals and baptisms, all those. And I know you had a Presbyterian minister marry you so so there's no like set plan for a wedding you can do whatever you want yes and there is a high wedding vow so actually Bryn and i performed the high wedding for elena for um so they had to please their family and so forth they did this lovely beautiful wonderful uh, church service and then they came out into the garden and we did the Baha'i ceremony. And here's, here's the, um, what Baha'is have to do to get married. Well, f first they have to agree, the couple has to agree. And in some cultures, that's a big deal, you know, where, where they marry off. Anyway, so the couple has to agree. And then all living parents have to agree to the wedding. All what? All living, living. parents. All so living that, parents. 11, I'm like. No, <laughs> all living parents. <laughs> no. The parents have to agree because ultimately you're joining two families, right? Um, and actually, Elaine and Fatai can tell quite a story about that. Anyway, so, um, so you have to wait until your mom agrees. Um, anyway, so, so then, uh, then you go to your local assembly uh, and say so you're going to uh, get married. Um, so when when it's the actual when you, the actual wedding ceremony is each of uh, couple the, the man and the woman will say we all verily abide by the will of God. That's it. So if a tie says it, plain says it, then you're married. That's it. It can go on for days. Baha'i is from an Indian background. Their culture is uh, weddings go on for days and dances and meals and feasts. And whatever. Fine. And, or uh, when I first became a Baha'i, I lived in Los Angeles and people would come into the LA Baha'i Center and 
their shorts and flip-flops and a t-shirt and say, we want to get married. And they would stand there and say, we all abide by the will of God and they were married. <laughs> uh, so it's, just, it's, it's very uh, individual. But there is, but uh, to, to get married, you have to say that vow, that one vow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a prayer of vow. So we have uh, two questions left and then that'll be our close. Mm -hmm. Um, one question was a follow-up to what you were just talking about, Shura. Um, if a parent won't agree, does a couple instead have a civil ceremony? If the, sorry, if, if the parents of the couple won't agree, does the couple instead have a civil ceremony? Uh, well, actually in the United States, all Baha'is have to get a civil ceremony anyway, but, um, but, the, but they, cannot, they cannot get married. If the parents do not agree, they can't come here. And the other question, um, we'll just close with this one. At what point in your life did you become aware of and join in the Baha'i faith? Is there a formal process to officially join? So I became a Baha'i in my mid thirties. Uh, I was working for Jacques Cousteau and he, I, I was a writer and he would never, uh, I, I did an environmental newsletter for him and he would never let me write about a problem without offering a solution. So I spent a lot of my time in the library reading about human motivations and my job was to get people to care about the whales if they even ever saw a whale in their whole life. Uh, so in the library, I, I, I kept coming up against this, uh, uh, altruism and so forth and back 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 and the reason ultimately the reason people do good things i kept coming up with is r word for religion which i wanted nothing to do with um anyway uh i investigated all just out of intellectual curiosity i went to all kinds of uh, christian churches and buddhist temples and jewish all sorts of stuff goes in la you could uh, it's all sorts of stuff. Uh, so, and it, so it was all interesting I could, and, and all had pieces of truth, but none of it moved my heart. Anyway, and finally a friend of mine uh, came to visit who had become a Baha'i and she told me about the Baha'i faith. I thought it was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> um, a prophet of God now? Anyway, I went away for a year and a half. I had a dream that told me to go back and my second informational gathering. I had a spiritual experience. That's all I can say. I was in my 30s. So then what do you do about becoming Baha'i? So, um, uh, so you just say, I believe in Baha'u'llah. The Baha'u'llah is the prophet of God for this age. That's it. And you're Baha'i. Um, we, we were asked, do people still do that? We were asked to meet with a local assembly uh, who had some questions. You know who Baha'u'llah is? Said, no. <laughs> how can you know? It? How can you know what a prophet of God is? They said, you got it. You got it. No. And then, do you know how Abu Baha is? Mm -hmm, the son. Anyway, they had a few more questions. I said, I don't know. It's fine. <laughs> you learn. <laughs> so anyway, that's a big behind behind my 30s. And the reason was I was trying to find ways to help the world. As short as I can make it. Well, thank you. Don't forget, don't forget the time when you went to the psychologist because you thought you were crazy about being religious. And then what happened? Do I have time for a little more story? See, so... So I had this religious experience and I have never ever had an experience like that. It was, it was, so my response was, I thought I better see a psychiatrist. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> and I'd never been to a psychiatrist before. So I asked uh, the secretary in the Cousteau office where I worked because she did all sorts of stuff like that. And so she, so I said, I want to talk to a woman. I'm not going to talk to a man about this. Um, I want it free. I don't want to pay for this. And I want a young end psychologist because I 
Somebody give me a book about Carl Jung. It was interesting. So she's okay. She'd look it up. So a couple of weeks later, she has friends and they came up with this person who was a young psychologist who lived in Beverly Hills, who the first consultation was free. Okay, I got my little Volkswagen and went to Beverly Hills. Uh, she said, why are you here? And I said, oh, I'm interested in young and psychology. <laughs> and she said, okay, it's interesting. Is there anything else? And I said, well, I became a member of the Baha'i faith. And she said, oh, uh, I, I, I joined a religion, I guess. And she said, which one? The Baha'i faith. And she said, oh, Aloha, which is the Baha'i, God is the most great. So she was Baha'i. So for six months, I went to her every week to try to get used to the idea that I was a religious person. Anyway, so yeah, it's a funny story. Funny story. Anyway, shoot. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad that we had a second opportunity to hear from you. I'm sure the people online um, definitely do. So thank you. Do we have um, time for the closing prayer? Yes, we'll have time. Let me just mention that um, the Marin Interfaith Council is doing a lot on Wednesdays. Uh, the first Wednesday of the month, we have meditations with Annie, who is a Brahma Kumaris, um, which we'll get to at some point in our um, series of, of different faith traditions. Uh, the second Sunday or second Wednesday of the month is always a meditation. And um, that's on Zoom, and you can find information on our website. The third Wednesday of the month is this, uh, getting to know your neighbor's faith, ask me anything. And next month, we will have Imam Fasi with us, um, speaking about the Muslim faith. So um, I hope you will join us. And yes, please come share your um, prayer. Is, is it Vicky? Or Sylvia. Sylvia Calder. I remember the last name, and, but please, Sylvia. would you come up here and share it? Okay. Thank you, sure enough, for asking me to say the prayer. Appreciate that. O oh, thou kind Lord, thou hast created all humanity from the same stock. Thou hast decreed that all shall belong to the same household. In thy holy presence, they are all thy servants, and all mankind are sheltered beneath thy tabernacle. All have gathered together at thy table of bounty. All are illumined through the light of thy providence. O oh God, thou art kind to all. Thou hast provided for all, dost shelter all, conferrest life upon all. Thou hast endowed each and all with talents and faculties, and all are submerged in the ocean of thy mercy. O thou kind Lord, unite all. Let the religions agree and make the nations one, so that they may see each other as one family and the whole earth as one home. May they all live together in perfect harmony. O oh God, raise aloft the banner of the oneness of mankind. O oh God, establish the most great peace. Cement thou, O oh God, the hearts together. O oh thou kind Father, God, gladden our hearts through the fragrance of thy love. Brighten our eyes through the light of thy guidance. Delight our ears with the melody of thy word and shelter us all in the stronghold of thy <coughs> providence. Thou art the mighty and the powerful, thou art the forgiving, thou art the one who overlooketh the shortcomings of all mankind. Thank you. Thank you.